So today's date is 20, 20 August 2022, and I am in Georgetown, Delaware at the Delaware Aviation Museum. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Lyman Hall. Right. Thank you, sir, for sitting down and talking to us. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Well, I was born in uh, Jackson, Michigan, and I'm a farm boy. <coughs> I was raised on a farm until I had to... Uh, till the Korean War, and then I enlisted there. We had a, uh, we worked as a tenant farmer, my father did, and uh, we had, uh, at this tenant farm, we had 200 acres that we took care of, 40 cows that we had to milk, and uh, we had 200 acres leased. So we had 400 acres that we took care of, and there was three of us that done the work, my dad. A uh, friend, a boy that came and lived with us, and then myself. So we done all the farming, milking, planting, all the okay. things that go along with the farm. And then when uh, I uh, joined the Air Force, then I went into uh, training from there. Why did you elect to join the Air Force? Well, uh, it was getting close to where I was going to be drafted. <laughs> and I had no interest in the Army, and I wanted to try and get something a little more out of it, and uh, so I joined the Air Force. What year was that? 19, that was February 1952. Okay. And it was probably uh, the biggest change in my life. Uh, up to that point, my education was really bad, and I went to aircraft and engine school and it was, to me, it was so exciting to be able to learn by working on the equipment. Uh, deals they had put together to simulate a certain, say, a hydraulic system or something, and get to work. And then education began to mean something right. to me. So actually, my education was from the time I went into the Air Force until I uh, retired from the airlines. I probably went to more schools than uh, uh, I could count. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you have any other members of your family that were, were military? No, not direct members. I had a, uh, my dad had a very close friend who uh, uh, I didn't know until I was an adult that he wasn't a uncle. And uh, yeah, he was with Patton. Okay. But when he come home, he never talked about it. He never was there. Yeah. He just never, to the day he died, never had a word to say about it. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you go to basic training? Uh, I went to basic training at Lackland. Right. Yeah. And did you have any inkling of what you wanted to do in the Air Force? Yeah, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a photographer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very badly. Uh, <laughs> I had had a little bit of photography in high school. And uh, at that time, it just wasn't the Air Force's need, so. I, did, I requested an interview for it, but they still turned me down. Right. <laughs> so what did you end up doing? I ended up as uh, going to Shepard Air Force Base and going to an aircraft and engine maintenance school. Okay. A and E. So how long is that school? Oh. It was about six months, if I remember correctly. 
And did you have any experience doing that prior well, to any born, kind of maintenance? Or? Being born and raised on the farm, I was uh, doing all of the equipment when we finally got tractors. I worked on tractors and maintaining all of the equipment, plows and cultivators. That was always stuff that had to work. Then when I got out of high school, I worked for a very short time for Fisher Body. I was a FBI man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, that was all uh, the repetition. So I didn't last very long. It got very boring. And I quit that and I went to work for Crutchfield Chevrolet. And I done uh, uh, mostly lubing cars, uh, wheels, stuff like that. And I was there until I went into the Air Force. So that's basically the only real maintenance that I had. Yeah. yeah. So when you're in tech school learning these, learning the, the learning the trade, did you, is this specific to an airframe or was it just generalized? Uh, it was, uh, if I remember right, it was uh, six, six weeks on an engine, and on a 3350 engine on a V29. And then the rest of the training was on the frame of a B-29 and all the systems. Okay. So you could work on many different systems on that aircraft. Yeah. Hydraulic system, electrical systems, uh, air can, well, uh, bomb racks, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Where do you go after tech school? Where, where's your first assignment? Um, fair. Fair. Fair child. Fair child. Okay. Working I, on V-29s? No, I worked cleaning up messes. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for four weeks, and they put it, all of us that went up there, in kind of a any kind of work that needed to be done. Right. We worked out of a pool. And then I got transferred down to Travis Air Force Base. Okay. At Travis Air Force Base, I was put in a uh, 23rd Strat Recon on uh, dock work on the engines. Okay. <coughs> what kind of aircraft is that? That was a B-36. B-36. Okay. Is that comparable to a B-29 in the systems at all? Yeah. There, well, there was a lot of advancement compared to the 29. But yeah. And it was a much larger airplane, 10 engines. And it had, actually, it was six reps and rep reciprocating. And then there was four jets. Okay. What was the mission of that aircraft? Um, we were under General LeMay's command, and he considered the considered that we were under in war. Mm -hmm. And our main mission was, first of all, was training, and then, if I remember the correct. Term, I think it was called the silver platter, where uh, out of his office, they would assign through the B-36 bases a certain number of aircraft that had to be in the air okay. all the time headed for Russia gotcha. with a bomb. And then, so when we got called, then we would fly to Russia, when they recalled us then, if we had enough gas, we'd go back. Or we'd go to a different base, get fuel, maintenance, that sort of stuff. Okay. But if we didn't get recalled, 
the object was under the commander and and the navigator, we'd go to our first drop bomb. Okay, and you were you were the mission was to deli deliver nuclear weapons. A oh, nuclear weapon, yeah. Okay. Now, did you fly on the airplane? Sometimes it depended on the aircraft commander. Okay. And normally he based that on whether we were whether he was going to be able to come back to the base. If he couldn't and he went to another base, then he needed his, the crew chief. So, yeah, he'd go with him. Okay. So you, were, you ended up being a crew chief? Yeah. On all that aircraft? I didn't start out there. Yeah. But, yeah. The needs of the military. Next yeah. <laughs> um, so you were, too, you were on alert, 24 hours alert? 24 hours a day. And you, and you, were, you were expected to be in the air how quickly? Should, should well, at the uh, at the uh, base at Travis Air Force Base, we uh, was basically under maintenance. As a crew chief, you had to let the maintenance officer know exactly where you stood with your airplane. So when the order came in, it would come in there, and they would assign the the crew from there. Normally on those trips, there it wasn't a, a five-minute deal or something like that. Now we were sent to uh, Guam, and on Guam uh, we were there for uh, three months, and there were several times that we were on a five-minute alert. So we, as a crew, the crew chief, we just stay out at the airplane. Couldn't make it that the other way. So we just sleep around the airplane somewhere. So the crew was nearby and you guys would be sleeping on the yeah. plane? Well, either right that or, yeah. yeah. Okay. What's it like to be living during that time and being on that that alert status, knowing that if that call ever came, your airplane was going to go deliver a nuclear weapon, and the ramifications of that. That's Did you a, think about it. When you're that's that a really interesting question that I've thought about a lot, but it was all after the fact that I, at that age, uh, no, I was never concerned about it. Uh, and I don't, I don't think I ever worried about it. It was just something that was part of the duty. Right. And you just went along with it. But after getting a little bit older and thinking about it, then it, probably, it kind of sets in then. Um, were there any memorable moments during that period of time? Anything that stands out for you? Uh, not really. I can remember one incident over Japan uh, where as a maintenance crew, the aircraft commander uses to relieve some of his men so we would be put on, say, a gunner's position, but as a fire uh, observer, making sure that uh, there was no conditions on the part you were watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aircraft had a lot of magnesium on it, so if it got, it'll produce its own oxygen. So everybody was watching for fire. I had the duty one time of a top observer. And when I sat down there, there was a little crack in the thing. We were at 40,000 feet and I called the commander and told him about it. And he said, well, let me know if uh, 
anything happens with it. It was about maybe 15, 20 minutes, so that little crack went bloop, spread by like that. Like that. He made an emergency descent. That was exciting. I mean, he just pushed it over and we went down to a habitable altitude of about 10,000 feet. That, that's the only real, and again, it's like your first question, was I worried of more excitement than there was any concern about it? Because you're young. Yeah. You don't think about that. You don't think about it. No, I, you weren't going to die. <laughs> How long were you at Travis? Uh, well, except for the uh, maintenance, I was there three years. And uh, the last year, I kept track of it. Uh, I was away from the base uh, half the time I was there. We were flying someplace. We were gone half that, half a year. Okay. Oh. What kind of places were you flying? Where, where to? Well, we went to Guam, Upper Hayford, England. Uh, let's see. We went to Alaska. Uh, oh God, I forget all the places. I can't remember all of them right traveled now. Traveled a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was one uh, deal where when I had first been put in a uh, crew chief position, uh, we had a mission that uh, the only thing I knew about it was that I was supposed to bring the crew with me. And what it was was a test to see if we could do a uh, maintenance, uh, where you, like where you bring a plane in that, a, a airplane here every year has to go through the certain uh, maintenance procedure. Well, Air Force had something similar Took six, took six uh, days at Travis to do that. We made an emergency landing at uh, Norton. They didn't know we were coming. Well, the base commander probably did. And uh, it was all civilian maintenance. And they wanted to see if with my crew and their maintenance, people how long it would take us to pull that same inspection. Right. We got it out in three days. So, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. That was, uh, I never saw so many colonels and generals in my life at that base. It was all officers, I think, right. come out to see the big B-36. What kind of things did you do um, during your downtime? Oh, what did I do? I don't remember having that much downtime. Okay. Uh, there were days when 18 hours was was not a uh, abnormal day. Uh, I was married, and between the hours that I worked and the number of days I was gone kind of destroyed the marriage. Right. Uh, Were you married before you got into the military? Or after you got Yes. Into? Okay. After you got out, after you left Travis, did you get out of the, out of the uh, Air Force at that point? Yes. No, I take that back. When I signed up, 
I signed up for four years active, four years inactive. Okay. So I was on an active, inactive list. But it didn't ever had anything to do with them, no. Right. Right. No. Anything else that you want to document about your time? Any any stories or any um, anything that stands out about your career in the in the in the Air Force? No, not really. I often think about uh, that there was probably a. I should have probably stayed in the Air Force. Uh, there was, well, I flew for the airlines afterwards, which was uh, probably the best job I ever had, but I could have flown for, stayed with the Air Force for the 20 years and still have got with the yeah. airlines. So, afterthought is, Hindsight. Yeah. yeah. Why did you decide to get out? Uh, at uh, 21 years, I thought I could do better. Yeah. And, and, well, I did, actually. But uh, it was just because I stayed in the same profession. Uh, yeah, my job with the airlines I could never understand why they paid me for something I would have done for nothing. <laughs> right. uh. That's a good job to have, a job that you would do for nothing. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you ever keep in touch with anybody that you, were, that you served with? For a little while I did, but I've lost track of everybody. Yeah. And at my age, I don't think there's too many of them alive by now. What would you tell somebody, young man or woman, who, who is considering a career um, in the military or in the Air Force specifically? Well, I've What's advised uh, more than one. I think that it would be the best uh, position you could take as a young person. There's uh, probably the first thing that you learn is discipline uh, yes. and respect. Especially respect for uh, um, and the education is well worth it. Uh, you can almost get it. I could have got an education almost in anything was available to me. Today it's even more. I think that it, it would be a good deal. And then in 20 years at 18, well, you can be 40, you still get a good job. Right. You got a lot of life left. Right. And, uh, now, I would, uh, I would advise anybody to give it very co serious consideration. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, how do you think that your, your, your military experience has uh, affected your life? Now that you've had some time to think about it, you had a second career, what would you say? I think probably the looking back at it from the airlines, I think they uh, probably the most important thing that I got was respect and my duty to the commander. Uh, for example, uh, and the airlines, once we move, moved the airplanes off the block, my responsibility, and as I was, as far as I was concerned, I didn't work for the airlines, I worked for that captain. And I was going to do everything that I was supposed to do to protect him. Uh, I didn't feel exactly like that in the Air Force. But I think that's where it came from, was having respect. My uh, aircraft commander was a uh, lieutenant colonel. And to me, he was like uh, Jack Armstrong. I, I thought he was the greatest guy that ever 
came out in the Air Force. And I think that's where it developed from was there, and then, then to have that respect for them. Then when we got to, back to the gate, then I worked for American Airlines, but during that time it was the commander that I had the respect for. So let's fast forward a hundred years, somebody's watching your interview. <laughs> what message would you send that person? Oh, uh, that's a good one. I never thought of it. What would I do? I would say that the best thing that you could do is to get an education from the beginning. I don't think there is anything that is more valuable to a person than a good education. From that, I think everything expands. Uh, it gives you the ability to reason uh, and get places. So, yeah, that would be my message: was get an education. Is there anything else that you want to document? Anything I didn't ask or? Well, one short one. Sure. <laughs> uh, I flew with a uh, friend, Pete Idris, 18 years old. He was shot down over France. I flew with him for, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years, and he became my hero. He was shot down, and and a B-29, and his mother got a deal that he had been killed. He had been rescued by uh, some farmers. They took him into uh, France to the underground. He lived in Paris for, I think it was six, seven months before some woman down they had him in an apartment upstairs. Some woman down below figured out who he was and turned him into the Germans. And he had been with the underground for that six months. Had went on a couple of missions with him. And then he ended up in prison for two years. And. Uh, he had a attitude of humor. Uh, he looked at everything that he'd done. That's how he got through it, was humor. And he just passed away about a year ago. And uh, I wished I'd uh, been able to have stayed a friend longer than I, I had. I really expected, respected him. Yeah. He was older than you? He was That's probably it. two years older. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you met him, where did you meet him? Flying. He was a captain. Okay. Yeah. He was flying, when you met him, he was flying the B 36s? No, he was flying with, with the airlines. At oh, the airlines, time. okay. Yeah. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, on behalf of the Americans for Wartime Experience, I thank you for sitting down and talking to us. Well, I we appreciate, appreciate your story. I uh, appreciate doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's our pleasure, and thank you so much for your service. Thank you.